Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, there we go. So much for the introductions. Stu, let's put our cameras on so uh, you can see that it's not a cardboard cutout. And there indeed we are. I'm Alec Hogg, and uh, this is, as you can read the Tommy's name, Stuart Lohman. Always good to be here, Alec. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and the two of us are celebrating Stuart's team that he supports vociferously. That's why we got blue in the Biz News uh, logo, or oh, the Blues of London. <laughs> uh, and they had a, was it a record win? 7 0. Uh, not no, no, I think the record's eight or nine nil in the Premier League, Alex. So not not too far away, but not there yet. And of course, my beloved West Ham yeah. United, who are fourth in the league this season, unbelievable. Anyway, let's uh, move on to things of a far more import today. Uh, we are going to be bringing you up to date with our webinar. It's been a fantastic month, uh, the month of October. We've also made a decision to add Avenge to the portfolio. A big uh, investment here. In fact, our very our biggest investment yet. It'll be sixty thousand dollars equivalent, nearly a million rand that'll be going into Avenge. It's not the biggest percentage-wise investment that we've made. It'll be eight percent of the portfolio. But there's some very good reasons. It's a, in my opinion, a, a fat pitch. Doesn't come along often. But we'll be uh, giving you more information on that as we go through uh, the discussion later today. But first up, let's find out exactly how the tech Nickel side is working, and Stuart, I'm sure you can guide us through that. Excellent, thanks, Alec. Uh, just there's a little high five button on the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you can see Alec and myself and hear my voice, can you just give us a high five to make sure it is coming through loud and clear? I see I've got a few high fives coming through, that's always a good sign. We also do like to keep it conversational. There's a little questions box on that same control panel. If you can please put your questions in there as Alec runs through his presentation, and we'll get to them as soon as possible. Alec, but all good this side. Brilliant. And that little question mark, it's so easy. You see the question mark, click on it and uh, tap away, and Stuart will be able to read them as I'm giving you the latest update. Okay, so now you've seen you've seen us. You see that we're not cardboard cutouts, that we are actually here. Uh, and uh, I'm now going to switch my camera off so we can focus completely on the screen. Stuart beat me to it. Uh, and as you can see there, the opening slide, I always put there the portfolio. Uh, return in 6.9, nearly, nearly seven years. Uh, it'll be seven years in a month's time, just over a month's time, uh, because we started this portfolio on the 5th of December, 2014, compound annual growth rate, 21.4% in dollars and 26.2% in rands. It's been a fantastic run, could have been better, could have been a lot better had we not sold Tesla, yes, I know someone's going to be giving me a little bit of a rev about that. We sold it in 2018. There were lots of people who sold it. We didn't go short on it. Uh, but my goodness, that would have made a difference in the portfolio. And even more recently, Cloudflare. When I think about Cloudflare, I want to kick myself. We bought the, sh the stock when it fell down during the uh, pandemic to $20 a share. It's now sitting at 180 Hey, Stuart. You know? I suppose what you need to do, as Warren Buffett says, is you trumpet your disappointments and then be very quiet about your wins. Agreed, Alec. I know it's hard to take, but we just move forward, as they say. <laughs> well, even outside of those, we've we've uh, we we've had a very satisfactory uh, return. Just to let you know, this is a model portfolio. So, in other words, we're not saying that you should replicate it exactly. It is to give you ideas. Please do your own homework. You can't in, give us money to put into this portfolio. You've got to do it yourself. And our uh, sponsors, Standard Bank, are only too happy to be able to facilitate that for you. So uh, that Standard Bank web trader who sponsor this, this webinar have been doing 
the sponsorship of this portfolio since we began it in seven years. And I know that there are lots of people who invest with, with WebTrader who are only too happy that we did actually have this initiative all that time ago because it has been a wonderful return. So without further ado, let's uh, go into the uh, portfolio itself and start kicking off with the uh, gangbusters October. Look at that. Purple Capital, the owners of Easy Equities, one of the few exponential shares listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, after having a great month the month before, had an even better month in October, up by 25%. Netflix, 15%. You know how I've been going on about Netflix. Well, I hope that you've got a lot of Netflix shares in your portfolio as a consequence of that. Zero, that's the best accounting software in the world. I think so. Anyway, we use it here at Biz News. It's a phenomenal product. Comes out of New Zealand, and we invested in that uh, some time ago. It's now suddenly starting to hit its straps. Uh, this, the share price did go down a while. I know that uh, the guys at Easy Equities, remember that's a low cost stockbroker where you can also buy zero shares there. It's the biggest share that they own uh, in their Australian portfolio. And I'm sure on a web trader, it's also one of the biggest shares. At a point, uh, you couldn't buy zero through web trader. That has changed. You can buy it now. So it had a very good month, 14%. And then Spotify, another one of my favorites. Uh, those of you who have been on this uh, webinar many times will know a bit, a bit of a stuck record on Netflix and Spotify, but both of those really showing up well in the last month. Microsoft continues to perform well. Uh, Apple and Amazon in the green as well. And the two stocks that have been disappointing, then, or relatively speaking, were disappointing again in October. Wilson Bailey Homes, I'm not worried about it, and I'll tell you more about that later. And neither to you. I had a look through to you's financial statements. We've only got the results, the quarterly results coming out in November, but I had another close look. This company is growing at 30% a year. It is profitable, it's broken into profitable. It is the dominant player in its field, which is online education, uh, tertiary online education, uh, is right up to doctorate level from uh, bachelor's through to doctorate. And it's sitting on $970 million in the bank. So as it is, it's profitable and it's got money in the bank. It's a bit like zero, profitable and it's got money in the bank, well, uh, well funded, a bit like Cloudflare as well. Uh, unfortunately, not quite profitable yet, but it's got lots of money in the bank. And that's what you need when you are going to be investing in a rapidly developing company. Two things, is it growing exponentially to you? Is 30% a year? Uh, secondly, can it continue to grow exponentially into the future? Well, it's got all the money uh, that it needs. So yes, it should be able to. I think maybe people are worried that to use not going to be spending its money wisely. The acquisition that it made uh, in the last quarter was not a bad acquisition. And it's certainly quite excited about the way that it can integrate that into the existing to you business. But who knows, maybe people have just forgotten about it. But to you is the disappointment at the moment. However, as far as uh, Mr. Hogg himself is concerned, do only see this as uh, par for the course because pretty much every single stock that we've put into this portfolio has gone down uh, before it went up again. So timing is, is not something that uh, one, when one's making a long-term investment that you should be paying too much attention to have a look at what the company is, the underlying business of the company. And remember, we follow Warren Buffett's view, which is when you buy a stock, your average holding time is forever. And it, it pays, up, pays off. As you can see in the last month, the portfolio grew by 3.5% in RAND terms and 6.5% in US dollar terms. So as we have got a, a bigger proportion of the portfolio in the American markets, it's nice to see that we outperformed the S&P 500 index, which is at a record. The JSE All Share Index also had a good run in the past month as well. So it, uh, it gives you a little bit of an understanding there with those numbers at the bottom. Moving on to historical perspective, uh, this portfolio, as mentioned right at the outset, was started on the 5th of December 2014. At the time, the RAND was 11 RAND 27. The RAND is now 14 RAND 70. So it hasn't done that badly, if you think about it, over nearly seven years. It has depreciated and it's added about nearly five percentage points to our uh, return. The, the compound annual growth rate, and that's big stuff, 
because as you can see uh, in the in the previous uh, slide, um, the compound annual growth rate we started off uh, there with two hundred thousand dollars or two point two five million rand. Okay, and that has grown the two hundred thousand dollars at a twenty twenty one percent compound annual growth rate to seven hundred sixty four thousand uh, dollars. The compound growth is the eighth wonder of the world, as Mr. Buffett calls it, and you can see that. So the rand in rand terms, the portfolio that we began with in October, in December 2014, was 2.25 million rand, it's now 11.25, almost 25 million rand. Uh, yeah, yeah, just get compound growth going and you can see what the, the impact is. Uh, then the rand appreciated by 40 cents against the US dollar in the past month. Despite that, however, as mentioned earlier, the portfolio went up uh, due to the uh, appreciation of the underlying stocks. Okay, let's talk about Avenge. Asked you, have you you bought Avenge? I think I followed Pete. He's mentioned it at the first conference, I think, the business investment conference, and he said it was a good punt back then. So I did follow Pete into Avenge early. A good punt, <laughs> a good investment, I think he said. Because what exactly? So Pete, <laughs> what Pete says is he says you buy a bundle of twigs. <laughs> And uh, in the bundle, he says, imagine you, you buy these companies that some might go bankrupt, others might perform extraordinarily. And he bought this stock, Avenge, at the time that many people thought it was going bust. Uh, and then at the, during one of the Power Hour interviews, fairly recently, he said, no, he still thinks it's very cheap. Because he bought it when it was going to go bust, and then he, he so he said it, it's very cheap. So what did I do? Go and start started researching it, and then Bernard Swanepoel. Now I, I've I've got a confession to make. He is a he's a very close friend of mine. We've been friends for many years. I don't have many friends who are top business people. I, literally, I could call maybe three. Um, uh, I just don't. When you're a financial journalist, you don't really, you don't really get too close to people that you might have to interview. But Bernard is now, he's a, he's a private citizen. Uh, he left Harmony many years ago and uh, he runs the Joburg in Darba. He's also, as I say, a, a good friend of mine and shoo, one of the smartest guys I know. Anyway, Bernard has just joined the board of Avenge. So we've got Pitt on the one hand, who's been saying to us, who's one of the, the great investment minds in South Africa. He's saying that Avenge is a, is still very cheap. Bernard joins the board. Now, Bernard doesn't waste his time. Uh, he will go somewhere if he can add value. And he's done that in every board that he's joined. He was on the Sunlum board. I wrote a newsletter about this a little while ago. Now you mentioned the three company boards that he was on, Impala, Sunlum, and there was another one. And the value appreciations in his time at those boards. I'll actually put the Omnia. link up. Omnia. Yeah, good idea to put the link up there. It was a, it was a premium newsletter. So hopefully... Uh, you opened that newsletter on that day. I said the non-exec uh, who has got an incredible track record. And, well, Bernard's, uh, he, he's, he's recently turned 60. So he hasn't, doesn't want to waste his time. He doesn't need the director's fees, I can assure you, either. So he's gone along to make a difference. And he's only on Impala Platinum's board, Omnia's board, and now Avenger's board. So I haven't spoken to him about Avenger. I mean, that would be, uh, that, that would not be right. You don't do that to your friends. You don't put them in the middle. But I know him well enough to say, this man, he's smart. If he thinks it's worth looking or, or going onto their board, well, then you, Mr. Hogg, pick up the annual report and read it, which I did. And the annual report is very instructive. Philip Hawkeby is the chairman. Now, Philip is a former Ernst & Young senior partner here in South Africa, went to London, where I think he's the senior partner of for the UK. Anyway, he's a very, very senior position at, at Ernst & Young. Philip is an absolute class act, comes from KwaZulu-Natal, and he is the chairman now of Avenge. So that's a big tick. The chief executive, Flanagan, is well known in the construction industry as being a maverick, and I love mavericks. I love people who have fun at what they do and do things differently and make uh, uh, make things happen. He does too. And then I looked at the underlying business here, and you've got two companies. You've got a company called 
McConnell Dowell, which is a Australian based construction business. And then Moorman's, which is a South African, it's, it's the South African construction business that Avenge has left. Remember, they went through a really rough time, and you'll see that in a, in a moment in the graphs. But Moorman's is a mining contractor. So ask yourself, is Moorman's going to have lots of business in the future? If you, for instance, sometimes we look at Wilson Bailey and we think, my goodness, if the infrastructure plan of the government, uh, the South African government doesn't come to fruition, then there might not be that many roads or bridges to build and certainly not that many office office buildings, et cetera. So although I'm a, I'm, I love Wilson Bailey, um, it, and I still think it's the last man standing in the South African construction industry, you always benefit exponentially or, or uh, um, more if you're the last man there. That's the, if, you, if you were going to build a, bus, a, a building, like the Amazon building in Cape Town, who do you give the construction work to? You don't just go to the guy around the corner or some organization that's just, just started. You go to the blue chip. And who's the blue chip? Wilson Bailey. Who's building Amazon's building in Cape Town? Wilson Bailey. So at some point in time, we'll see uh, the, the, the benefits going to Wilson Bailey. But another thing is Wilson Bailey also has a huge Australian operation, which is bigger than the South African operation. Avenge has got a huge Australian operation, which is bigger than the South African operation. Isn't that interesting? So where Wilson Bailey in South Africa has to think about bridges, roads, um, office buildings, factories, etc., cetera, Moorman's is very focused in the mining contracting field, and that's booming. So as long as the commodity prices are firm, this company, Moorman's, that side the, of, of Avenge, is going to be enjoying a very good time. And indeed it has been. But what got me even more excited about this business? So we start off by saying, okay, the people. Who are the people involved? The people are top quality. Then you look at this graph. I to pull it out of the annual report. And this tells us everything. If you look back, look at the one on the right-hand side. In 2018, there were, there were suggestions that Avenge would actually not survive. We've seen what happened to Group 5, Basil Reed. Uh, a number of South African companies have gone to the wall in the construction sector. And certainly in 2018, Avenge was one of those that was teetering. In 2019, you can see the financial year to end June 2019. Uh, when you look on the right-hand side table, uh, both uh, McConnell, Dow McConnell Dow made a small profit, uh, the Australian operation, but Moorman's, the South African operation, lost money, and the other businesses in Avenge, which have now been disposed of mostly, uh, lost a, a lot of money as well. So you're sitting there at a loss in Avenge of over 600 million rand in 2019, but they put together a plan in 2018 how they were going to turn the business around. So remember this. This is a plan that started in 2018. 2019, big losses again. 2020, you saw losses, but much smaller. And, not, and then you could, you could probably be as clever as Pit Fulun and then say, look, I can see the trend. I've, I've looked at this company. It's going in the right direction. Now's the time to buy in 2020. And of course, uh, as as Stuart said, that's what he suggested to us at the web at the uh, investment conference. And please do book for the next investment conference. We we've got a fantastic lineup, and including a investment masterclass with Pitt and David Shapiro. Anyway, all the details are on the website on business.com. Just uh, uh, Google business investment conference. You get all the details you need there. But then look at the next thing. This is to June 2021. That's why the annual report has only recently been issued. Suddenly, you've got a company that's got the stuff it's going to get rid of, losing 122 million. But the two core businesses, if you add those together, they're making 550 million rands now. Suddenly, you've got a very, very exciting operation. When you look forward for both McConnell, Dahl, and Moorman's, the uh, prospects are excellent. Now, why would the share price have done this? If you, if you can see on the left, it's a long-term share price. It's a 15-year price. This was a stock that was at 65 rons a share at one point. It's now six cents. 
And if you look at the graph on the right, which goes back uh, from when the turnaround was implemented, you can see even then, 2018, on the graph on the left, uh, the share price graph on the left, uh, Avenge was in deep trouble. Uh, it certainly wasn't in those heydays of 65 rand a share. It was sitting at around two rand a share, one rand 80, as you can see on the graph there. And it plummeted as the difficulties turned into an existential issue, i.e. exist, can it continue to exist? Well, in 2018, the plans were made. Uh, you had little upticks as some investors got excited about uh, what Flanagan and co were going to say about what they would do at Avenge, changes in the board, etc. Uh, but then that all came back to the reality that this was a company in a lot of trouble. So they had a rights issue and another rights issue to raise money to shore up the balance sheet. And you can see since second half of 2018, the share price has been in the penny stock range. It went down to one cent, Stu, at one point. I think it was what two cents and they did a rights issue at one cent. I think I'm not sure if it fell to one cent. But the initial, yeah, the initial rights issue. They did another rights issue at three cents just the other day to raise another hundred million rand. Or oh, I said the other day, it's six, seven months ago. But it's been a very smart approach. So they've what the what the guys said at, at Avenge was we are where we are. Let's now turn this thing around. What do we need to do? We need to sell off non-core assets, we need to raise money from shareholders to to bolster the balance sheet. And we need to get our core businesses profitable. And are those core businesses uh, worthwhile having? Certainly McConnell Dowell in Australia and Mulmans in Africa. It's a South African primarily business here, but contract mining is a fantastic business, especially in Africa, because you would get Australian uh, entrepreneurs going to the Australian market. They have a, a deposit uh, on the continent somewhere. They don't know how to mine it but they certainly know how to mine the markets. And so they can raise the money to exploit that uh, that, that, that uh, deposit. And then they phone Mormons and say, come in Mormons, come and do the work for us, which Mormons does. That's what it specializes in. You've heard the old story about who, make, who made the money in the gold rush. Very, very rarely was it the miners themselves. It was the guys who supplied the pick and shovels. And the people who are supplying the pick and shovels here is Mormon. So great business, especially if you're based on the African continent, as they are, because it's not easy doing business in Africa, as anybody who's tried it will know. So the share price has gone from one cent, as you as you heard from Stu earlier at the, the first rights issue. And when the share price was running at two cents, you could have bought shares for one cent. And then it went to four and five cents, and now it's at six cents. So you've got to ask yourself, if it's gone from two cents to six cents, it's trebled already, isn't all the action done? Well, it, it might be the case for some people's minds. In my mind, if you have a look at this company's earnings, according to the annual report, this business made two cents a share in the last financial year, two cents, and it's trading at six cents. So there's a little bit of dilution coming from a about another 10% dilution, but even take that out of it. You're talking about, a not a cigar, but you're talking about the kind of stock that Benjamin Graham would get excited about, Warren Buffett's uh, guru. And to me, it's it's that, that fat pitch that doesn't come along very often. Where do you get the opportunity to buy two really, really good businesses, which are in the average stable, at a price and, and get your money back in three years, price to earnings of, of, of three times, PE ratio of three times. So although we are not mad about buying operating businesses we, we, where there is not exponential growth, and although we did make a mistake in Tongart, you'll remember that well, uh, but again, I think Tongart longer term would have been a, still a, a great, a turnaround opportunity. The problem with Tongard is that it's in KwaZulu Natal. Who wants to put money into KwaZulu Natal after the riots in July? Who was going to forecast that riots would have happened in July? And no matter how you want to cut and dice and slice all of that, it, it wasn't. It wasn't something that was on the horizon. So the consequence of all of that was we sold out of Tongard, and I see they're still 
pretty much around the level that we saw we we sold out on take your medicine and off you go but this is a different turnaround situation this is a company that's got really really strong board it's cleaned up its act as far as non-core businesses are concerned it's in the process of selling them or or certainly getting them out of being a drain and the two key businesses are now starting to hit their straps and and recovering nicely a big thing here is if you're a, a subsidiary of a company that's really struggling and take moments as an example what does moments do it needs mining equipment it's expensive and if your parent company is struggling you don't get capital to go and buy new front-end loaders and tlbs and graders etc but now that the that avengers uh, debt is under control uh, it's it's gearing ratios far better it is in a position to reinvest in moments and that's exactly what the company is doing at the moment it's exciting it's an exciting business and now's the time to be investing in it certainly in in from what i can see so putting that together what have we done we've allocated half the cash that we had we've taken 80 uh, sorry, 8% of the portfolio and invested here at $61,500 or 900,000 rands. Sounds crazy. It's the biggest investment we've made uh, in total uh, in, in any uh, company, but that's because the portfolio is now over 11 million rands, whereas it started at, at 2 million rands or just over 2 million rands. So it's not surprising. If you want to get an 8% stake, you're going to have to do quite a big investment. And doesn't that look interesting? 15 million shares in average in the portfolio. I thought it was over the top with 333,000 purple shares, but 15 million average shares. I don't think you're going to have to rush in and buy at six cents and then because the share price uh, is going to run anytime soon. These things take time. It takes investment committees time to uh, to, to say, well, this is a fallen angel. Are we happy? The annual report's out now. You'll get the number crunches looking at the numbers. And if they're satisfied with it, they'll do the investment. But my feeling on all of this is that you are not really going to be getting much better opportunity. It might get down to five cents. Who knows? Uh, there could be a big seller coming out at some point. But for me, a price to earnings ratio of three times Man, that's cheap if you've got a business that isn't going bankrupt. And we now know that this one definitely isn't. The rest of the portfolio, over 50% is invested in Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. We're going to have financial results tonight, uh, South African time, from Microsoft. Uh, then on Thursday, from Amazon and Apple. We've had results from Netflix, which continues to rise on the back of those numbers, very good numbers. Uh, and we are also going to be having results from Spotify and to you in the next couple of weeks. So there'll be lots to to look out for, uh, but look out for that in the in the premium newsletter. I'll either write about them in detail, as I did with Netflix, or uh, refer you to the articles uh, that have come through. Netflix, well, that's a phenomenon, and maybe uh, we need to just uh, dwell a little bit on that in a moment. But looking at the portfolio performance. I pulled out this chart on the right hand side to let you know because you know when you've had this incredible run as we did since March by uh, staying invested and indeed upping our investment uh, in some stocks at the at the worst of the pandemic you you look back on it and you think mm, well you know maybe the best time behind oh, for this portfolio is behind it so I pulled out the year-on-year -year increase. If you'd bought into this portfolio in October last year, you'd have made 17% in US dollars. Sure, can't, can't complain about that. Of course, if you'd been lucky enough to buy uh, in November 20, well, November 2019, uh, you'd have made 61% by November 2020. So what I do like about this is that the year-on-year -year growth although it's not up to our compound annual growth rate of 20, uh, 21%, it's still very, very healthy at 70%, at 17%. And as you can see from the chart, it's quite clear this portfolio is at its highest ever. So we had a really good October. In RANDs, not so smart, really, because the RAND has been stronger than anticipated. 
And as you can see there, year on year, the portfolio is 6% higher in rands, uh, a little better in August. In fact, we were lower August 2021 than a year ago, but in rand terms, up 4%, up 6%, primarily because the rand has been very strong against the US dollar of late. We know that whenever the rand is strong against the US dollar, you better be careful uh, because you, you, well, we know the rand is predictable and it's only predictable that it's going to shock us by going down at the time that we last expected. But the rand's done pretty well up to this point in time, uh, certainly in recent times. But that's nice to have a look at that portfolio. Again, you go back to March 2020 uh, when the pandemic really started taking hold and you can see how well the portfolio has done since then. So all you need to do sometimes is just grit your teeth and, and ride it through. Historic performances, Amazon, Apple and Microsoft, our top three, not surprisingly, uh, are also our three best performers. What we did here was follow Buffett's advice to the word. And when you buy a share, you hold on to it forever. The only time you sell it is when there's a fundamental difference uh, or when there's some scandal that's erupting. We misread the scandal supposedly at Tesla uh, and uh, we sold Cloudflare when it appeared as though uh, there was there was a lot of discussion about was the were emerging technology stocks in a bubble and uh, we bought the argument and lightened on uh, on some of our emerging technology stocks and then of course sold Cloudflare which with hindsight was uh, about as smart as the Tesla decision to sell that but uh, you can't win them all and the rest of them have performed really well with the exception down the bottom there Wilson Bailey and to you but no problems there nice to see that zero is now coming uh, it looks reasonable, a reasonable investment, in fact, a very good investment of 15% in South African rands. And the rand dollar over the nearly seven years of the portfolio has uh, given a 30% lift to the portfolio generally. So that tells us. Purple Capital, look at that. Hey, Stu, have you bought some of those as well? Yeah, we bought up, up did get, had a few lucky ones with Purple as well. I got in quite early. I know Charles has been a great, you know, picture to look at because of what he's doing there the disruption and stuff plays very much into our sort of philosophy but remember he was also at the business conference at the yeah. very first business first investment conference and i know one of the members of the audience after charles savage told the story and where they intended to go went out and put fifty thousand rand into purple stock which at that time i think was around about 60 cents and now look at it. He must. He's paid for his membership, <laughs> life membership of the of the uh, of the conference into the future. It'll be good to have uh, Charles Savage back at the conference in the near future. But what a good return! Spotify uh, is much better than it looks because we bought it early. Um, it, we sold out of Spotify at the time that there was worries of the uh, bubble of in emerging stocks, and then I just couldn't uh, stay away, and I. We made a decision to buy back in earlier this year. In fact, I can tell you when it was. Uh, there it is, 25th of May. We bought back into Spotify at a price of $234. What had happened also just to enhance that return, you can see on the right-hand side, was the RAND was very strong at that side. So uh, if you look at Spotify, go along the line there, you'll see the percentage rise in US dollars is 10% since we bought back in. But in RAND has been 17% because the RAND was uh, particularly strong. I think it was late 13s at that stage. So that's been a good year as well in a very short period of time since May. It's, it's uh, the annualized return, of course, is, is very healthy indeed. There's the individual stock performances. You can see them. Uh, Amazon uh, has been our 10 bagger. That's been the one that's for a long, long time carried this portfolio, but great returns from Apple and Microsoft. Uh, Netflix is now starting to really uh, deliver. And then Purple Capital in relatively short time has been a, a, a good return as well. And that, dear friends, is it. So I'd urge you to um, add your questions. What we try to do is the, do the presentation about half an hour and then have about half an hour for questions. Uh, we are a little over the limit but uh, of the first half, but that's not surprising given that there was quite a lot to talk about with Avenge. Thanks, Alec. There's a question on Avenge. It's from Paul. 
this talks about the 500 to 1 consolidation rumors of Avenge and you asked how will that affect the share performance in the short to medium term if it does happen? Yeah, well, who knows, you know, with these things. At the, uh, sometimes we get a bit confused uh, by thinking that retail investors drive share prices. The real driver of a share price is an institutional fund manager. When the institutions go in there and they put their money behind uh, a, a particular stock, that's when the share price can get turbocharged. In the United States, they are having uh, maybe a, a slight change to that or certainly a challenge to that with massive retail interest in stock markets there, you know, a company called Game Stock and uh, what's the other one, AMC. There are a number like that that have uh, caught the attention of the retail investors. But even so, the retail investment is only about 20% of the stock market over there, even though it's it's almost at record levels. So when you look at a six cents share and you're an institutional fund manager, a one cent change in the price is very volatile. So if you can get the the changes in the and remember you you can only go from six to seven or from six to five, and if you go from six to five, that's a, a double digit decline in one share price movement, and from six to seven is a double digit increase. That's too volatile for many fund managers. So if you had a consolidation of the stock, in theory, it should be very good for the share price. Thanks, Alec. So Vas wants to know, why add a stock at this stage? He mentions you said you're going to stop the portfolio. I think it's more about you're going to start a new portfolio. So he just wants to know why. You don't yeah, eventually. no, good, good question. We're not going to stop this portfolio. There are many people, uh, especially web trader clients, who have been invested in these shares from the outset and they've replicated, if not from the outset, certainly we've been going for nearly seven years. So for a lot of time during that period, People have come in, they've they've replicated the portfolio. We're not stopping this portfolio. This is the web trader portfolio. It will continue as the web trader portfolio. What we are going to do from December is we're going to start a new portfolio to make it easier for people who've got less money uh, as a as a capital. I'm I'm going to start there with a hundred thousand rand in capital, and then work on how you would break that down. So. It, if you happen to have 200,000 Rand, well, if you want to replicate that portfolio, you can double up on everything. But it's to give uh, uh, many of our premium subscribers who look at this and say, my goodness, I can't afford one Amazon share. It's going to cost me 50,000 uh, Rand uh, to get a single Amazon share. And you're asking me to put you know, 20% of my portfolio in Amazon. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to need a portfolio of what's that, 20%, so you would need 50,000 Rand a share, um, you need like a million Rand um, to, to have a portfolio to even start replicating this. It's not easy. So rather than that, we're saying, let's start something different. I obviously won't be able to put Amazon in because it's too expensive, it's 50,000 Rand, but, and that would be 50% of, of, uh, of that portfolio. But the, the new 100,000 Rand portfolio will be looking to have a different balance to what we have here. And I'm pretty sure you'll find Netflix will be in there, Microsoft will be in there, Apple will be in there, uh, Zero will be in there, and so on, Spotify as well. And we might have a, a couple of other surprises for you, but definitely Avenge would be in that portfolio. So we're not closing this one down, we're just starting a new one so that new investors or in people who, who haven't had a chance to be with us over this over the seven years can now start using a new model portfolio either to replicate or to uh, to, to make their own homework. Arun has a question on Avenge. He asks, in an article in the start stated that the group's profit was due to once-off items. It was actually a loss without these once-off items. What's your view? That's not true. Read the annual report. Uh, Robert says, um, "Were you going to look? You were going to look at Nampak some time ago. Any thoughts?" Yeah, I did look at Nampak. Uh, it is it is improving. 
um, but it's not a, it's, it doesn't jump out at me. You, remember, when we have a look at the investable universe, then we go right around the world and we've got every single stock in every single company, uh, sorry, every single country to choose from. And NAMPAC wouldn't come out there, I'm afraid. It just, it, it just, it, it doesn't come through that filter. If it's a South African company, it's got to be a, a cracker. And to me, Avengers are cracker. Harry Burter says he still holds Facebook. It's up almost threefold. Yeah, he well done, Harry. <laughs> he says, with a negative press, is it time to sell? It's another one we sold. Yeah. Uh, Harry, you know, sometimes you're too close to these things. Uh, to me, both Google and Facebook have got a model that is not sustainable. It doesn't make sense. How can you have, in our country, they've got 80% of the advertising model and not pay any tax. Well, we know what's happened there. We've now got an international uh, uh, change to the tax regulations. And Amazon and, uh, sorry, Apple and Google will have to pay the South African authorities up to 15% of the profit they make from South Africa. And I don't know if people's done, people have done the, uh, the, the number crunching on, the, on this as well as they should have. Because up to now, Apple, uh, sorry, Amazon, well, all multinationals, but particularly Amazon and Facebook have had a free ride. They've been selling ads in Australia, taking the money 100% margin, zipping it back to, because it is virtually 100, not, a, not exactly 100% margin, but it's a massive margin. And they zip it straight back to their head office in, uh, in, in the United States, where they use other ways of reducing their tax liability. And the Aussies, uh, well, are, are paying for these adverts and there's no return to the Australian economy. Well, here in South Africa, well, the Aussies actually are fighting them in, in a big way. But here in South Africa, it's a, it's a better way of looking at it. Most big corporates, for very good reason, because Amazon, it's, I keep saying Amazon, Alphabet or Google and Facebook offer a irresistible advertising offer. They, you, if you want to go mass and you want to have uh, buy certain segments, and you want to get it cheap as chips, that's who you go to. So it's commoditized advertising, which has made life very difficult for NASPAS as South African operations, which have been losing hundreds of millions of rands every year. They thank goodness for them. They've got uh, they they own such a big chunk in ten cents. That's how they keep going here in South Africa. But um, uh, Google and Facebook in future are gonna to have to pay tax in South Africa. And this is a, a decision that was made only in the past month. If you start thinking about that, 80% of a market, or even call it 60% of a market globally, it's not sustainable for two people, to, two companies to hold on to it. There must be anti-competitive uh, um, anti actions and so on. So, but every time I've said that I don't, I don't like the, a model of Facebook and Google, and I do think that they're going to have gale force winds coming at them at some point because of regulation. Uh, it's it has not uh, impacted. We have seen them pay huge fines uh, to the European Union, and increasingly now there's with the Democrats in in power in America. There's more talk about that, but uh, that's why we sold out of Facebook ages ago because of, uh, of uh, Cambridge Analytica. One little point though, uh, which is recent, Apple has changed its regulations. And now, unlike in the past, if you had Apple computer uh, and Facebook wanted to track you, they could track you. Now, Apple says to you, would you like to be tracked by third party advertisers? And of course, most of us say no. And that is going to affect Google and, and Facebook in a big way. We saw the results coming out from Snap, which is a much smaller business, and their advertising revenue is down 25. In fact, their share price fell 25% on the results, and the reason for that, that they, they ascribed it to Apple's new rules. So Apple, by looking after us as consumers, is certainly putting a spoke uh, in the wheels of Google and Facebook. 
Ryan wants to know if you'll still use Web Trader for the new portfolio. Yes. Well, I don't know, Brian. Uh, it'll still be Standard Bank. Yeah. Put okay. it that way. Because there's a sneaky one here. It says because you get fractional ownership through easy equities. I'm not sure if Shift offers something down the You're line. You're not supposed to say Shift. We're still negotiating oh. with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are we are going to be. Uh, Santa Bank Shift is a is a is a low cost operator. No, Stuart is. Um, I'm joking. It's it's no it's no state secret, but uh, they are. Oh, that was a question I put to them. I said, look, if you if you guys are going to be our partners, um, we do need you to uh, to to do something on the fractional shares. It's not that easy in a big organisation like Standard Bank. Whereas easy equities have got fractional shares. So uh, we will be we're talking to shift at the moment. And the idea would be that Web Trader is for the professional. And uh, you've heard Brett Duncan on many occasions, he says, look, we don't we don't compete with easy equities. Easy equities is very low cost and has got fractional shares. And of course, it works brilliantly for people entering the market. For the more professional investor who wants to have greater uh, research uh, available, who wants to be able to uh, set limits on the sales of prices, uh, manage their portfolios perhaps more aggressively, uh, have stop losses, et cetera, then a web trader is a, is a more attractive option. Uh, another thing in web trader, although we don't have a UK stock in our portfolio, web trader, you can buy in the UK, you can buy in virtually every market in the world, whereas with easy equities, they are restricted to US and Australia. But that's a competitive thing. What we're looking at here, Standard Bank is our partner, They're, they've been our supporter uh, from the beginning of this portfolio. And for web trader clients, we're going to continue with this portfolio. But with Shift, they are in many ways going to be competing head on with easy equities. And uh, they've got some. Uh, well, certainly the prices that when I looked at the costs, they are extremely competitive, if not cheaper than easy equity. So that's where the new portfolio is going to come from. Brian wants to know if you've got any thoughts on Renogen. You know, Justin loves it. Eh? He enjoys You quite like it, don't you? I'm Renogen. conflicted. My schoolmates, the COO, that's why I follow it. But I'm, yeah, I try to keep a bit of care. Okay. I like what they're doing. I think they're quite innovative but it's small you know? it's, it's to me and it doesn't really mean anything but uh, it's very expensive for what you're buying and i say it doesn't really mean anything because if you want to go and look at what cloudflare trades at that's very expensive although cloudflare does have the owns the global market in security internet security whereas i don't know renogen is a is still a very small company it's it's not really uh, one of those that you'd put uh, in a bottom drawer and sleep easy at night. It's probably a bit vol volatile for a portfolio like ours. I think also commodity based, Alec, because they do mine helium. So it's not really, if we look at your portfolio on the exponential element, I don't think it has it yet. They might develop something down the line, but. They seem to be highly innovative and uh, certainly they they know how to mine the market. Yeah. Yeah, they certainly know how to tell a story to investors. So, but for me, um, it's it just isn't uh, and and it's no reflection on the company because I haven't done the research, but it isn't uh, the kind of stock that would fit easy in this portfolio. Mike asks, if the market is getting hot and you're more than fifty percent up on a share, do you take some profits off the table before a possible collapse in the market? Does... Mike, I'll tell you something. Every single stock that we've sold that is an exponential company, We've been kicking ourselves. And I'm talking there about Facebook, as you heard earlier, has gone up threefold. Uh, Cloudflare, um, uh, Tesla, those three. Where we did sell companies that were not exponential companies, um, a couple of banks, Barclays Bank, we sold, they're still below what we sold out at. Uh, Metro Bank is a fraction. We sold at 30 pounds, it's still like one pound a share now. So sometimes you do sell, but you don't sell on price. You sell on fundamentals. You sell when there has been a change to the underlying reason why you bought the share in the first place. If you take a, a, a wonderful saying that, again, that Warren Buffett says, 
if you see a cockroach, know that its cousins are sitting in the same kitchen. In other words, if you see something really bad coming from a company, and you could actually go back here and, and have a look at Avenge. Look at that share price. There were cockroaches there uh, that, that were quite obvious coming out uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, and then 2014, the whole army arrived. So they were in the kitchen, and you could see the share price sliding, sliding, sliding. And then in 2014, 2015, uh, the, the, the army arrived. And then it, it, they thought they'd exterminated them, 2016, 2017, it wasn't the case. And there, still, you're talking about seven rand a share, down to one cent or two cents. So just be careful uh, to, to catch a falling knife, as they say in investing as well. When a share price is falling like that, just be very, very wary. Uh, I, on the other hand, if a share price is rising, unless there is a there's a cockroach that you see, stay with it. I suppose Stanov's also a good lesson in trying to catch falling knives, Alec. You're, <laughs> you're embarrassing me now. <laughs> Oretile asks if you have any views on the Sabanya Stillwater's purchase of the mines in Brazil. Um, Justin is attending the uh, presentation this afternoon at three, so he'll be able to inform us better. In fact, he's going to do a piece for us uh, on, on business tomorrow. My overall, the kind of broader sense here is that many of the big mining companies are still hurting from the decisions they made in 2008 when was the, at the peak of the last commodity boom. At that stage, they hadn't seen a commodity boom in a long time. They believed it was a super cycle and they went and bought very expensively. Neil Froneman also made his mistakes then. He was busy with uranium, but he's been around the block quite a few times. And he's one of the few mining CEOs who right now is still seeing value or pockets of value. And he's got, he's got uh, the track record, which tells you he doesn't make too many mistakes. So what they've just done now in buying the nickel, nickel's huge in electric cars. And every day we hear something more about electric cars. So Neil was smart in taking Sabanya Stillwater out of gold into platinum and palladium in particular. And that's been a, a huge winner for him. Uh, platinum, of course, is the... Uh, is, is used in diesel and palladium is used in petrol catalysts. So with uh, diesel engines going out of fashion, uh, but palladium being used for petrol, you've got that upside. There's all The, the world is so complex, uh, but definitely he made the right call there. And if he's making a kind of bet, a billion rand bet that uh, that he's doing in South America, you can be sure that he's certainly looked at those numbers very carefully. And sure, it's a little bit of a gamble, but his gambles have come off so far. So my gut instinct would be to say, go with a jockey. He knows how to ride that horse. Stephen asks you for your view on PPC. He says you bought at an average price of 70 cents. Uh, does he continue to hold? No, oh, well, they got the government on their side now, haven't they? Well, with the cement, yeah. The government has decided that uh, PPC shareholders are more important than uh, South Africans who use cement, and that's the decision they've made. So, yeah, I, I, you know, you can get all moralistic about these things, um, but you, you've had a, a game-changing decision from the state. Uh, which at this point in time is in your favor. If the state were to eliminate uh, or to to reverse its decision that you can only use locally produced cement when you're building uh, government-related projects, if it were to change that, uh, then you'd have to reassess. But right now, why sell? Christian asks, what needs to happen for you to become interested in process and mass pass again? Unbundle Tencent. Or yeah. tell us you're going to unbundle Tencent. The, the China story is, is scary. It's really, really scary. 
uh, it's Mao Zedong uh, had a, a thing called the Little Red Book that everybody in China was supposed to own and read, and and uh, the, the whole personality uh, um, concept of Mao uh, got them into such big trouble. As he might have been an absolutely brilliant and superb leader to begin with, but in the end, there's very little doubt that history has you know has, has judged him harshly. Tens of millions of people died under his watch. Xing Chaoping has taken a big gamble uh, in the past year in ensuring that the limits, the term limit on his presidency uh, was abolished. So he literally can be president for life now. He has a little book, a little red book, that people in China are expected to read to uh, to understand his way of of the world and why his way is right. There is stuff going on in China at the moment which has got to be concerning anybody who's invested their money there thinking that they're going to get a proper, a decent return. When you have a government that is promoting a quote, common prosperity, unquote, approach. What are your chances, and it's a communist government, what are your chances of making profits? The best years of Tencent are behind it, long, long behind it. And Naspers is a proxy for, for Tencent, as is process. Were they to unbundle Tencent? I would then look at Naspers very differently. But at the moment, the Naspers assets are a fraction of the value of its 10 cent holding. And as a consequence of that, if you were just looking at the NASPES assets, you'd have to believe they were overvalued. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just before we close off, Dave wants to know, how do you see inflation potentially impacting stock selection going forward? Whew, that's a big question, Dave. And we've seen what's happened with cryptocurrency, that uh, it's become the new gold. People are um, investing in crypto not all of them, but a big chunk of them, on the understanding, on the belief that you can't make new Bitcoin. There's this limited supply of Bitcoin. And as a consequence of that, forget all the other attributes. That is, a, it makes it an inflation hedge. I was reading something, um, uh, George Kokolos, who uh, people in the investment world will remember. Uh, anyway, he, he writes to me, he lives in Greece now. I think he is, he's originally Greek. He, he op sends me interesting things to look at. And one of the most interesting recent uh, notes that he dropped me was reference to the real inflation rate. And by taking away from what the state in the United States is saying the inflation rate is, and you have a look at a, a different basket uh, that these economists have put together, they reckon the inflation rate in America is already 12 to 13%. Now, overlay that with the fact that you've had a massive increase in debt in the United States and in many Western countries, including here in South Africa as well. How do you get rid of debt? The only way to get rid of debt is to increase taxes or to reflate the economy so that the debt is worth less because inflation, you've got debt of 100 million. And if the inflation rate is 15% a year, then the effective value of that debt next year is going to be 85 million, and so on and so forth. So it's if you have no inflation, it's going to be 100 million that you've got to repay indefinitely. And that's why reflation is just about the only option. If governments try and increase taxes, they get voted out of office. So what do they do? What do they do with the debt burden? You've got to reflate. So on the one hand, you've got governments that are very keen to get the debt burden off their balance sheets or to reduce it. And the way that they do that is through reflating the economy or through encouraging inflation. And inflation, an easy way to encourage that is just to keep interest rates lower than the inflation rate. So, and you've seen this, the, just a rational mind will have a look at house prices in the US and house prices in the UK, where if you want to buy a house today to guarantee that you'll get it, you pay above the listing price. And that's the truth. 
it's as hot as it's ever been, the house market. And that's telling us as well, just like Bitcoin is telling us, that the inflationary expectations are now very high. So how does that affect shares? Well, it, it certainly takes away the advantage that rapidly growing companies have over value stocks. If everybody's growing at 15%, then the difference between the one growing at 45 and the one growing, or the one growing at 30 and the one growing at two is reduced because the one growing at 30 is maybe now 45 and the one growing at two is now 15. So you can see the proportional difference. And then that changes the weightings of value and growth stocks. So proportionately, then you would be investing more in value stocks than you would be in growth stocks. So there's lots of, there lots, there's lots of uh, head scratching in an inflationary environment. We can look back at what happened in the past and, and try and extrapolate. But as you see now, gold is not running despite the inflationary expectations being higher because people are going for Bitcoin instead or those who would have hedged themselves with gold are now looking for a different hedge. It's a complex world. You've got to just keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, try and understand as best you can. Make your investments based on what you understand. And then if it, if from what your, your assumptions are, if, there, if there's a change, if there's a cockroach that emerges, then have the, have the guts to, to take a decision knowing that you're not always going to be right. You know, you too will one day sell Tesla at $300. Good place to leave it, Alec. You've just gone past one o'clock. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Stu. Thanks uh, very much for being with us again today. And we look forward to being back in your company again at, on the last Tuesday of every month. Yeah. Except for December. But yeah, next month will be the last Tuesday. Except for December. Some of us have got, oh, but, but we'll do one in December, but we'll it'll just one. be earlier. It'll be earlier in the month, but it's the last Tuesday. And uh, I urge you to go onto Biz News TV on YouTube. Just put a, uh, it's got a little button that says subscribe, click on the, onto that, and then you'll be pinged when the uh, video is ready, when the webinar is, is ready for you to see. But until the next time, from me, Alec Hogg, and Stuart Lerman. Ciao. Cheerio. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio. Thank you.